All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We are going to go ahead and get started. My name is Edith Juguna, and I work at Education Systems Center, and we are one of the organizers of the Illinois 60 by 25 network, along with Advanced Illinois and the Illinois Student Assistance Commission. Thank you all again for joining us on this webinar on virtual learning and work-based learning with an equity lens. This is the second in a series of webinars that we are organizing for the network. It was a direct response to what we heard from communities during the last webinar. We heard that folks are very interested in understanding how communities are using an equity lens as we move more to this virtual learning approach. And we are very fortunate to have representatives from three communities who will share with us what they're doing to address this issue. All right. So in terms of our goals and agenda for today, we wanted to connect with Illinois 60 by 25 leadership communities, share resources, and learn about how communities are tackling challenges around all types of remote learning. We've broken up the webinar in two chunks. The first part is on virtual remote learning more broadly, and we will get some updates on ISB's guidance on remote learning. And we'll also hear about how one community has implemented virtual learning using an equity lens. And then we'll talk about virtual work-based learning. We'll hear about best practices for virtual work-based learning and also learn about how two communities are supporting students in this area. And there will be opportunities to ask questions after each speaker is done. But please feel free, as I said earlier, to put questions in the chat box and we will manage them as we go along. And now I will turn it over to my colleague, Emily Raska, to give us some updates to the ESB guidance on remote learning. Thank you very much. So I'm going to just provide a brief update on ISB guidance around remote learning and instruction. I'm not going to go into great detail, primarily because obviously this is a set of sensitive issues, and the last thing we would want to do is provide information or guidance that is not reflective of what is being expected by ISB. And so um, if we have ISB colleagues on the line, I definitely welcome them hopping on and sharing more, um, but definitely will direct you to the guidance document that's linked in the slides. We will be providing the slides out as a file after the fact. But ISB has a really updated guidance on mandatory suspension of in-person instruction. It includes all sorts of information on accountability, on what to do around attendance and measurement of attendance and calendaring, remote learning guidance, special education guidance, et cetera, et cetera. Just some highlights from the remote learning portion is that districts are expected to be developing a remote learning plan. There are also remote learning planning days. Those remote learning plans will not need to be submitted for approval for this guidance document, the current guidance document that came out on the 8th. It needs to include information on how students are going to be instructed, that how we're addressing the needs of different groups of students, including students with disabilities, English language learners, homeless students, other vulnerable students, etc. It needs to include planning around transitioning back to on-site learning. There needs to be clear communications around it, etc. Districts are enabled to adapt an e-learning plan if they already had one in place, but you need to make sure that you're meeting the, the basic requirements of the remote learning plan. And the just kind of key difference for it from ISB's perspective is that remote learning is learning that happens outside of traditional classrooms, just given the separation, the distancing that's happening between students and teachers. So it can be in any sort of time frame that the school or district sees fit, the way they want to measure attendance, et cetera. And it could be e-learning, but it also could be other forms of learning that students are doing in their own way. So I'll just pause there for a second and see if there are just questions. And I will say that um, I may not be able to answer them directly, but we will uh, be following up with ISB and can circulate back with folks if there are specific questions. If you looked at the guidance document and have questions that we can elevate, feel free to add them to the chat box and we can try and address them or elevate them to ISB for clarification and future guidance efforts from them. I'll just note that there also has been a guidance document around remote learning or a recommendations document, I should say, it's not formal guidance. It really includes a lot of great content around how to handle instruction, grading, social emotional learning, communications about remote learning plans, all sorts of implications of this current context. And again, we'll continue to share these resources out both during this webinar here as well as moving forward. All right. So we have worked together with a couple of other state agencies to generate this really amazing website that 
um, you know, one of the concerns that we know has been emerging um, in this current context is that there are a lot of students and families that do not have access to Wi-Fi in their homes. Um, and so that is getting in the way of students being able to participate in e-learning and other kinds of virtual learning that's taking place. The, there is a new website that's linked here, and again, we'll be sure it out. You can search by your zip code, et cetera, and you can find a Wi-Fi hotspot essentially that's near where you are. When you open up one of these little Wi-Fi logos, it gives you instructions on how to actually connect, like what the process is for connecting to that Wi-Fi. So it's a really terrific new resource, and so I encourage you to share that widely with your communities if that's helpful. We think that this is a really good thing just to acknowledge that not all students and families are going to have exactly the same access to just broadband and internet. And so just being able to identify those resources where they are available is really important. So we're really excited to see this resource. Um, sorry, yes, I got a question. Yes, you have a question from Enlace around okay. are school districts creating individual class schedules or do school districts have specific requirements to follow up? I don't know if that's a question you're able to answer or if yeah, I don't think I should answer that necessarily directly. I mean, there's the guidance document that I was referring to, and I've got my print copy here, <laughs> um, has a lot of detailed information around what the expectations are in terms of attendance, et cetera, and how districts are empowered to determine attendance. I would say that I know that there's a number of CPS folks on the line here. Um, and so just given in Las Vegas, given your location in Chicago, if there's anyone from CPS who can speak to how CPS is planning on handling class scheduling and, and how that, that's going to roll out, would welcome you throwing those thoughts in the chat box. But we can also follow up and provide that insight after this webinar. But that's a great set of questions. All right. I'm going to turn it over to Bridget French with Rockford Public Schools. Okay, great. Um, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm Bridget French. I'm the Executive Director of College and Career Readiness for Rockford Public Schools. And uh, we've spent a lot of time putting together um, some distance learning or remote learning plans for our students. And I'm, I'm thankful to have the opportunity to um, show you what we've put together today. So I'm going to show you first what our parents see, and then I'll cover sort of the back end of how we put it together. So. Um, when a parent would go to our website, they would see the distance learning button on the home page. And then it will take them to this new site that we've created that has a variety of resources for parents, including um, where they can get information about how to pick up a device, a Chromebook. And um, we've also created grab and go packets um, for learning opportunities for those that may not have devices or those that want additional support our additional enrichment activities for their students. Um, then we created a school page for every school in our district. So if you're a parent, you would find your school. Um, and when you get to your school, then every teacher has their own link. And so our instructional technology um, team and some others of us that were um, called to help because either we have a knowledge of technology or uh, we were just willing to help kind of developed these pages for all of our schools. So this is um, the elementary school actually where my fourth grader goes, just as an example. Then this is what you would see when you click on your teacher's name. And so uh, starting Monday, this Monday the 13th, um, we started our remote learning. We expect all students to be accessing um, some sort of activities and checking in with their teachers um, at least once a week. So up to this point, um, the activities we've been providing have really just been to keep kids engaged in some sort of learning. But starting this Monday, um, we began um, ensuring that all of the activities that we're providing for our families are tied to state standards, cover some topics that they've already learned. So I think you, you probably know that in remote learning, we're not allowed to introduce any new content, or if we do, students cannot be held accountable or graded for it. So. I'm um, just ensuring that we're, we're not going to see any learning loss or avoiding as much learning loss as possible. So this is a slide that really talks a little bit about how we provided equity for our family. So um, we really focused on getting devices out to um, students in grades three through 12, knowing that the activities that we were providing in our grab and go packets could provide enough enrichment activities for those um, kindergarten through second. 
And so um, out of about uh, 19,000 families, 14,000 of those needed a device. And of those families that needed a device, about 1,200 of those still indicated they do not have internet access. Um, so what we're doing uh, about the internet access is we're having our office professionals call every single family and we, our communications department has written a script for those families um, and for the office professionals to go through how to access those Xfinity hotspots. And if in some cases there's still no internet, um, because our district does include um, some pretty rural areas, then we instruct them how to pick up grab and go packets. So again, these grab and go packets cover um, standards that have already been uh, covered throughout the year and also include additional enrichment activities for families whose kids might need more. Um, we've also provided opportunities for families to pick up school supply kits for those who may not have them. Um, we have uh, six locations throughout our community uh, in our schools that are uh, pickup sites for not only food, but school supply kits and the grab and go packets. And then um, of all of our families, we had about 900 families still indicate that they don't have transportation to get to the school sites to pick up either devices or grab and go packet or school supply kits. So next week on Wednesday, um, our bus drivers are going to be going to um, bus stops where families have indicated they don't have transportation and providing them any of these items that they might need. So on uh, March 13th was um, the first day of our spring break, but also obviously the, the first day of the shelter in place order. So those grades are the baseline for the rest of the school year. Um, for elementary and high school students, um, they can maintain or improve their scores. Uh, middle school students receive a pass or incomplete. Um, high school students will still receive a letter grade or an incomplete. Um, students that were failing on March 13th have to engage in learning and demonstrate some sort of progress to improve their grade. And if they don't, then they will receive an incomplete. Um, we know that there are likely going to be a significant number of incompletes when this is all done. So we are also putting a plan together for students to access if this happens to go through the end of the school year, um, some sort of summer school enrichment program that will help cover um, the areas that students were lacking. So this is the first slide of what we sent to our teachers. So one of the um, one of the things we really stressed to our teachers is that we really wanted everyone's plans to be consistent so that our students had a comfort level if um, their you know, families have multiple siblings in the district that everyone was seeing the same thing. So we, we created a slide deck that said, delete this slide before posting and gave instructions on how to create the slide deck. So not only did we create the template for them, but we also created an instructional technology site that had some examples of different lessons that they could provide for their students. So these are just examples of the slides that we provided to all of our teachers. This is the remote learning instructional support site that a lot of us contributed to, especially our department for CTE work, um, pathways work, AP, and dual credit. And then obviously our curriculum team had a lot, a lot of input into the site as well. We just provided some examples from some of our teachers that had a high comfort level with technology and just like dove right in and created their lessons. And so we contacted them and asked them if they would be willing to provide their lessons as an example for other teachers. And of course they were, they were happy to do so. Also on the site, there are grab and go packets that families can download. So families that would want those packets for additional enrichment opportunities um, and have printing capabilities at their house could download the packets. Um, at home and use those as well. Um, we also have additional support here for um, our students with special needs. 
And then we also do have an early childhood program. And so there's early childhood support here as well. And so this is um, an example of one of the pages. A lot of these resources under pathway courses were actually accumulated through webinars like this and some through our partners at ConnectEd that provided us some great resources for college and career readiness and some virtual um, work-based learning opportunities. And then we just put some information there about what happens for our students that are taking dual credit and then some links to uh, the College Board site that has resources for um, AP. And then um, the last thing um, that we launched, which was a little controversial at first among some of our teachers, is a check-in document. So this is an example of a high school check-in document. Um, what we're asking our teachers to do is indicate the number of students in each of their classes that they've checked in with on a weekly basis. And if they have a Zoom call with 30 of their students and 27 of them checked in on the call, then they can mark down that they, that they contacted 27 of those students. The purpose of this is really to make sure that we have a really clear understanding of students that we might be missing. And for students that we may be missing, uh, we've developed problem solving teams at each school, which um, are comprised of our social workers, psychologists, um, special ed administrators, our office professionals that not only make calls home, but also may contact students in their classes that they know are friends with those students. Just really kind of thinking of every way possible to make sure that no student is disconnected, that all students have some sort of touch point throughout this uh, remote learning session. Quick question, Bridget. When you say, um, just to clarify, because I think this might be a question for other folks too, as they're thinking about imp uh, implementing similar models. When you say if they have a, um, a Zoom call, with 30 students and only 27 check-in, do you mean that if the class, the roster is 30 students but only 27 participate in the webinar, um, just like the, their presence on the webinar counts as a check-in, I'm under, assuming based on your description, or could you yes. just say a little bit more about that? So, so high school is obviously a little bit more daunting than say elementary school. Um, but yes, yeah, so if you have a roster of, 20, of 30 students and 27 um, check-in to the Zoom call, then you've made contact with that student in that week and you have three additional students that you need to reach out to. We ask that, that teachers reach out to students, um, try to reach out to students twice and if they still don't hear from them, then they refer them to the problem solving team. Then it's the problem solving team's responsibility to try to reach that student and figure out why is it that they're not connecting. So then we can just kind of open it up. Do folks have other questions for Bridget um, as, as you've heard about the process that Rockford has undertaken to do this work? And thank you again, Bridget, for sharing about the work that you've done. This is a really terrific set of resources, um, really thought out in terms of that equity lens of making sure you're able to reach all students and what are the different ways you can reach all students and how do you leverage all of the different resources and personnel at your disposal, right? So having that check-in team, the, the problem-solving team of the social worker and social ed and psychologists and office professionals, et cetera, working closely together is a really um, holistic approach to reaching out to students and figuring out what does it take to really r remain engaged with students in a, in a time like this. So I appreciate you sharing that model. Um, if folks have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask over the phone or over the line here or throw it in the chat box because um, you know we'd love, love to provide that opportunity for discussion and questions. This is Nancy Coleman. I'm just curious about um, consistency between classes. For example, let's say there are five sections of biology taught are all five biology instructors in a high school using the same curriculum? And is that the case across all of your five high schools? Or does everybody develop their own lesson plans and instruction? What does that look like? Hi, Nancy. Um, so yes, we. this has been a great opportunity for us to align our curriculum. And That's our awesome. curriculum deans have um, spent a lot of time working with our teachers over the past few weeks up to um, this, this Monday. 
um, working with them to align curriculum. So I, I think, you know, of all of the terrible things that COVID-19 has um, impacted, there have been some benefits to us as a district. And one of those is the opportunity to align our, our curriculum across, um, across teachers who are teaching the same level especially our core content, whereas before, maybe that was not the case. Okay. Um, and then, you know, just the opportunity to really um, reach out and understand the situations that all of our students are in. Um, you know, this has been a great time to, to further develop some relationships with our students. And just one other clarification, I understand that they're reaching out to everyone and not reporting and reporting the ones that they are unable to reach, but is that a weekly requirement or what does that look like exactly? It's a weekly requirement. So okay. all of our teachers have to reach out to students um, once a week. And part of what the problem solving team will do um, will be to connect with other teachers to see if there's one teacher that has made contact with the student, but another hasn't, um, to connect those dots as well. Great. Well, thank you again, Bridget, so much. It's really, you know, obviously this has been the center of so many different conversations happening in our state. What is it going to look like? How are schools handling it? And while we see, you know, on Twitter and on the news about all of these really exciting things that communities and districts are doing, it's really helpful to dig into the meat of it and what does it look like to, um, develop and monitor and implement a remote learning plan in a community. So, and especially through a, a lens of equity and acknowledging where students and families are at and making sure that their needs are being met. So really appreciate it. Thank you for the work that you're doing. I'm going to transition to my colleague, Heather Pensack from Ed Systems, who's going to talk about um, virtual work-based learning and introduce a couple of really terrific partners we have in the network um, who are have some specific examples of what this looks like in the current crisis. Awesome. Thank you, Emily. And hi, everyone. Excited to be here and to be sharing this. So to start out and thinking about virtual work-based learning, you know, I think a lot of us right now are trying to adapt and shift and do what we need to do during this time. But I think it's also important that, you know, we've, we've thought about a lot of different needs in work-based learning, right? Like transportation can be um, a big barrier and a need for folks to implement work-based learning, right? So how can we start to build systems now as we think about what it means to be virtual and working remote um, to support that equity of access for transportation? Um, and also, you know, just the distance sometimes of partner sites. So even if an individual has transportation, it might take them, you know, an hour and a half to get uh, somewhere. And then that's a three hour round trip. And now what does that mean um, for an individual's work-based learning experience? And in that too, I started to think about, you know, the diversity of partner sites that you could have, right? Like you could get more flexible and creative, right? It's, it's not so much about where that partner's located anymore, right? This could be a partner that you're working with potentially out of state or even like an international partner, right? Like really thinking about that. Um, and even the, the diversity of the size of a partner, you know, I think it can be really difficult sometimes for sites to really do that one-on-one -on -one in person mentoring. Um, but, you know, if this is something remote or virtual, they can be a little bit more like flexible in their management of having students or participants um, on their site. So that's something to really be thinking about as well for this and your diversity of the partner sites that could be offering this. And also student needs, right? We all know that there are very diverse needs for students to have um, the support and access that they need to um, experience work-based learning and participate in these experiences. So just want to definitely be thinking about that now as you all are shifting and adapting in this time of how are we really building systems and opportunities now that are we can continue to utilize in the future and not just necessarily during this situation. Also knowing that there's there's just going to be things that we have to do right now um, to address the current and evolving situation. And really as you're thinking about um, the sustainability and the equity of this and really still having quality work-based learning is keeping that focus on what are the essential elements and outcomes of work-based learning, which is to enhance skills and knowledge in a program of study or a career interest area, developing those essential employability competencies. I think, you know, we're all learning new ones as we're having to collaborate or, or we're um, and enhancing ones that we have, right, as we have to learn how to collaborate virtually. And this 
I mean, even just being able to do Zoom meetings and virtual calls is an essential employability competency in this new and changing world, right? Um, and then how are they still, you know, as they're experiencing work-based learning, how are they still being assessed and recognized for the knowledge and the skills that they are acquiring? And so what does this look like, right? Um, I'm thinking about, so here at Ed Systems, we currently have a high school intern um, from the Chicago Public Schools through the Urban Alliance Program. And so I've been, I've been thinking about them a lot in this, like what does their experience look like to do virtual work-based learning, this internship, and still have something um, intentional here with Ed Systems. And so there's definitely an increased focus on individual self-reflection, right? We are, I mean, in this moment, we are very isolated, right? Um, and so spending a lot of time really having students to be empowered and engaged to really be understanding what they're learning and how they're learning it and thinking through that um, and being able to ask questions. I think um, we all can relate to, you know, asking a student or an individual, well, what did you do? What did you learn from this experience? And they're like, I don't know, why, what did I, you know, sometimes they, they really struggle being able to um, identify that and say it out loud or write it down in a resume, for example. And so this is a really great time um, to focus on that individual self-reflection. But there also needs to be really intentional distance mentoring. Um, this was a great concept actually that Urban Alliance sent over in their weekly mentor email. Um, and just really thinking through what it looks like to continue to develop and maintain relationships, especially for those individuals who are in more of like a long-term experience, such as an internship. And so really thinking through what is that method of communication that's allowable and accessible for both um, individuals and their mentor um, at that partner site. And, you know, for each of you all, I, I know there's like different guidance or um, allowabilities for that, but making sure that external partners understand that and are aware of it. Um, and know what kind of methods of communication are allowed in order to um, speak in a responsible way with students. And, you know, students have been very much removed from structure right now. They've been very used to, you know, a daily schedule, um, seeing certain people, doing certain things. And so really making sure that there is structure in this distance mentoring, that there's an agenda for each discussion. Um, I know, like, the intern and myself, Caroline, like, we really at the beginning, just have a, a general check-in. So that agenda really going through like a general check-in, especially right now, you know, like, how are you doing? What's going on? Like we all, I think our, our productivity, our motivation has very much like ebbs and flows and, and the individuals, the students that we're gonna be working with are also gonna have those ebbs and flows. And so I think, you know, as um, a partner is being flexible and being understanding and checking in on that, um, recapping a previous meeting, talking through, you know, the tasks that are at hand, what the goals are. Um, and then, I mean, with Caroline, especially, uh, my intern is really chatting with them too about their post high school plan. Um, and if there's, you know, she's a senior in high school. And so thinking through like, how is that changing or shifting? Like those would be things that we would be talking about. Um, throughout her internship. So just making sure that that stays on our radar and that we keep thinking um, in that forward uh, positive motion. And then again, to the structure piece, just really mapping out some form of frequency and timing of calls to create structure. But again, like our, our work and personal lives are very much colliding right now. And there may be students who have um, needs within their own family, within their own household. And so really being understanding and um, accommodating to create that structure and address any scheduling needs of the student. Um, and then Bridget mentioned earlier about connected and this bottom here was um, from a webinar that they had recently. And so really thinking about in terms of again, equity and access, how are opportunities being provided that address those multiple levels of technology access, which ultimately affects your ability to interact remotely, right? If you have no access to technology, you're at that level zero your interactions are very much limited, right? And it makes it really hard to have those meaningful feedback and, and conversations. Whereas at level three, you know, you can have very meaningful conversations still, even though technology might fail you sometimes. Um, it's still, if you have that technology access, you have those meaningful interactions still, even though they've shifted a bit. So here, again, I know a lot of folks are familiar with this, but just wanted to put this up here. So Illinois as a state, um, the source there is at the bottom, and I know we'll have a list of um, resources here as well, but the Career Pathways Dictionary defines these terms, defines the work-based learning continuum. And so as I'm talking through um, these virtual work-based learning experiences here in a moment, these are the definitions and the terms that I am referring to. So career awareness, right? This is that moment when 
individuals are really just being exposed to a career interest area. They're being exposed to what opportunities exist within that area, right? I mean, this is a really great time, like in health sciences, for example, there are so many different careers within health sciences that you might not even think about. Um, and so this is that moment to be exposing them to that. So Lynn Weiss, actually, um, they were on our last webinar viewing in and um, was hoping to have them here today, but again, schedules. So we'll get them to um, present moving forward at some point. But they're doing a lot of work with the Evanston Work Ethic WE program to shift their essential employability trainings to virtual. And so just some best practices they shared is making sure, again, that those are interactive, um, or maintaining as much interactivity and targeted engagement as possible. You know, when I think back um, to my own experience of doing these essential employability workshops, you would play different games, you would have different activities, you would just constantly be changing the way that you're um, exposing students to different essential employability skills and not just being like, here's the definition and reflect, right? You would be doing group projects, you would be doing little mini competitions, maybe some true or false. Um, activities and you'd be meeting in small groups. So really still thinking through as you're shifting any of those trainings, how are they still interactive and they're not just, um, you know, delivering in information. And there's a there's a bunch of resources on here that um, we've included. So ConnectEd again has some really great day at work videos and they, they go by different industry areas and you see, you know, quick clips of what it's like to work um, in different environments and in different industries. The Northern Illinois University P20 network um, is doing career pathways virtual trailhead video. So these are new um, and they're interviewing folks. And so they're actually recording. They have the facilitator and then the other person um, kind of recording that interview. So you can watch them interact. And Illinois WorkNet, they have a ton of different um, available resources for skill and interest surveys to do employment 101 training, different job skills guides. Um, and then actually the Three Rivers um, EFE just shared recently, they're organizing um, all by core areas for CTE, all kinds of different online learning links. So there's there's a lot there as well. I mean, it's it's been really inspiring um, and awesome to see how folks are just like coming up and developing materials and trying to get it out there to support um, the full system. So in career exploration, right, there's some things to think about here. So this is still kind of that awareness, you're starting to get familiar um, with an industry or with a career, but there really now needs to be that direct engagement with someone in that industry rather than just watching a video. Um, that student, that individual should have the opportunity to ask questions um, and really have that back and forth potentially with someone in the industry. So I know there's been some spaces who are doing like panels of speakers, right, to address a variety of career options and allowing um, for questions. I think it's important here, again, you know, everybody's grappling with like, how do you allow these communications to happen? So, you know, having a staff member, whether it's a teacher or workplace learning coordinator, coordinator whoever that might be, um, facilitating and being on that panel, right, to um, just, again, be, what's the word I want to use, like observing um, the interactions and addressing any needs as they might arise. And so um, if there are partners, right, that you consistently engage in work-based learning, you know are advocates for this work, um, would definitely just encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to be reaching out to them and exploring some different ways uh, that they could interact with your students. The Illinois Science and Technology Coalition, ISTI, they have a mentor matching engine. Um, and so you can use that resource to be finding different mentors um, in the STEM fields. And then, you know, again, not endorsing any sort of like platforms or anything like that, but there's there's a lot of resources out there. Um, and so like NEPRIS and Virtual Job Shadow, definitely been looking through them. They're free for a limited time. You know, some of these eventually are going to um, cost money, but I know right now a lot of things out there are really allowing you to try it out for free. Again, as they know that folks are um, grappling with this changing environment here for work-based learning. And then just a note, you know, when you think about, again, those different levels of access, like if there's any way to um, download video transcripts and send those to individuals, like Bridget was talking about how they're um, picking up the packets, however you can do opportunities like that for students can also address um, that full spectrum of technology access. One resource I forgot to include in here, but we do link to the um, toolkit at the end. So in the Career Development Experience Toolkit, there is a guide on there to do informational interviews. So if you need um, inspiration for different questions to be sending along to students as they're having these interactions, um, there is a, a template, a guide in there for you to utilize. So again, moving along the continuum is thinking through team-based challenges and you know, now you have it where students are interacting with one another, but they also would have um, 
some sort of like educator or um, coordinator or facilitator from the school or organization. And then they would also have that industry expert facilitating that conversation as well, right? So now you have potentially at least like two kind of adults, um, one who's an expert in the field, and then um, your group of students. And so really thinking through here, um, what are the different virtual platforms, the ways that you can continue to share information that you know, both the, the teacher, the facilitator, and that employer, the industry expert, um, they can also be providing comments and feedback and suggestion for students. So what does that look like? And again, thinking through that structure piece, what does it look like to have some sort of regularly scheduled meetings so that um, students and everyone continue to stay accountable and held to the different tasks that they were assigned for the team? And, you know, having that dial-in option, again, thinking through like, what are the different ways if students don't have technology access that they could still be contributing to this team-based challenge? Um, you know, and uh, I'll have, um, I know, sorry, <laughs> Jennifer will be talking through this a bit too, um, but how are you really thinking about those multiple options for the ways that they're going to present information, right? There isn't just a single way to show that you have understood this and you have tackled this and you've thought about that problem, that relevant issue in your community, whether it's writing a report, creating a presentation, recording a video, or being able to present live. Um, and some resources included there are, you know, different inspirations and different guidance, thinking through what some of these team-based challenges might be um, for different pathway areas. And then the last um, kind of two slides here to show you before I move over um, to some of our communities here to share what they've been doing is thinking through your career development experiences, your CDEs. And so again, these are the more intensive work-based learning experience. They tend to be your internship, your co-op programs, supervised agricultural experiences. And so really thinking through that space, you know, I know the summer's coming up, there are a lot of spaces who are gonna do summer internships. And so now how do we get thoughtful about our summer internships? Um, I know, Coming up next, like Jennifer will talk about how they're closing out the school year internship with quality and making sure that students get that. I mean, this is truly could be a life changing experience to take on an internship and engage in something like this. So how are we still thinking through engage and have students participate in that this summer or moving forward. And so, you know, thinking through and manufacturing engineering technology and trades, you have a lot of different remote careers, right. So Again, just kind of thinking through some inspiration of folks that might be interesting to reach out to who may be, you know, have some more understanding of this might be more willing um, to have a virtual a remote based intern, but then also those tasks right so and one of the resources included here um, is career development experience tasks and they're sorted through um, the different pathway endorsement areas. Um, and so you can think up through those and again thinking about your different levels look from level zero all the way through level three, what are the different things and tasks that students can be engaged in um, and still have a meaningful career development experience. And I, I think I saw a question from Anisha about organizations still offering paid summer internships or unpaid. And I would just address that quickly as I'm, I'm hearing lots of different things. And I think a lot of organizations don't always have full clarity for themselves what's going on for the summer. And so it's just a really important time that folks are staying in contact with your partners, um, and, you know, would love like to hear to move to questions here in a second. If there are spaces on here who are, know they're going to be offering summer internships, maybe what adaptations or what they're doing to make sure that those are still occurring and how they're communicating with their school partners. And then so kind of in the same way, if you did this as well for like arts and communication, right, you can really think through this for all the different pathway areas. Um, what this looks like to have, what are your different remote careers, what are the different tasks, again, thinking through those levels all the way from really limited access, um, or again, I mean, even the, the map of the different Wi-Fi hotspots is an incredible resource, but again, that's not a consistent um, resource that a student would have, they would always have to go to that hotspot, so, you know, maybe a student who might consider themselves level zero could do some of those level one and level two items, but it's it, it's going to be difficult because they're going to have to get to a space where they would access Wi Fi right, but they could still be challenged um, and motivated to do that. And you know what also just have you all think about like what projects you have I, our intern Caroline right now, you know we're all moving into the zoom space I'm still grappling with it sometimes and I almost was going to do polling on a webinar the other day and then I totally like chickened out because I got really nervous. Um, and so she's like helping to put together a how to guide and looking through different videos and creating a, a resource for our team to just have a quick like troubleshooting. Okay, here's how I do a poll quick, quick, cool. Um, and she's testing that out with her friends, which I think is helpful for her as she's really missed um, that engagement with folks that she's used to talking to. 
So that's what I have here, just kind of a, some general um, best practices and thoughts for work-based learning along the continuum. Yeah, I mean, we'd love to hear and definitely open it up to you all, that question about contending with student safety and privacy expectations with virtual work-based learning, right? Especially if you have something like an internship. And so I know in our own space, like definitely using, um, in terms of calling, using our conference line, right? So that I, I never actually have access to Caroline or interns um, personal phone number, but we're calling into a conference line, um, using things like our, our Zoom line, everything that's through our ed systems as a team, never using any personal platforms to be um, communicating through and communicating very heavily through email. Um, Carolyn and I too have like a shared um, collaborative document that has her schedule and tasks for each week. So doing, doing a lot of that, but you know, would love to hear too what's happening with you all as you're thinking through student privacy um, and interactions with partners. Just really quick, we had had some conversations here with some of our academy coaches here in Rockford um, about student safety and privacy expectations. Um, if it's something where it's, you know, if they're able to, you know, all students are able to get online um, for, you know, a class, whether it be, uh, you know, a Q&A with a subject matter expert, that they're always invited by the teacher. So the teacher mm -hmm. kind of has that right to invite the person um, versus the students kind of doing it one-on-one. -on -one. So at least it's being monitored somehow um, by the teacher that way. That's just, you know, one thought, one aspect. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important to think through those, those links and those ways that there's never personal information shared, right? That there's, there's a login, um, but they couldn't potentially contact each other outside of that login that's been facilitated through the teacher or organization. Mm -hmm. yep. And I know we move over to Jennifer too, and they talk through their program. Um, they'll talk through some different ways that their employees are also communicating with the students that they serve. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce here Jennifer Irvin, who's with the BJC School Outreach and Youth Development for BJC Healthcare, and has just really thought through some intentional ways to make sure that their interns, as, as they've abruptly kind of had to leave their space, like how they're still um, closing that out with quality. So I'll turn it over to you, Jennifer. All right, thank you. And so just first a little bit about BJC Healthcare. So BJC Healthcare is made up of 16 hospitals and my department, BJC School Outreach and Youth Development is a one-stop shop that partners, facilitates any kind of school partnerships with any of our hospitals. So um, we have a very robust practices in place. Um, I'll just go through the slides and then at the end, if you have questions, we'll tackle those. So what I'm focusing on now is the aspect of our career exploration where we every year will have um, career and technical education interns. At one particular hospital, the Bourne Jewish Hospital Complex, um, we have approximately 22 students. Um, they start in January, their internships, and they will typically end when school concludes in May. So we already have practices in place in terms of how we assure quality of our internships. Every day the students come in, they check in they actually clock in we have a time clock over by our volunteer office where every student clocks in we make sure that their attendance is monitored so that we know that they arrived and typically either myself or one of my colleagues is there to actually visually take a look at the student to make sure they're in uniform and they're ready to go for the day um, once they check in we make sure that they're okay then they're off to their internship site within the hospital then at the end of the day which is at around two o'clock uh, the students began to check out um, and during the checkout, again, they clock out, but then there's also an opportunity for them to either, I have them to text, to send me a text, um, using my business phone, send me a text, let me know if there's anything that we need to talk about right away. Um, if there's an emergency, they will text me. Otherwise, at the end of the day, they will send me an email update just to let me know how things are, have gone for the day. And typically on that email, the school business partner is, copied in on that email. So the pro pro career and technical education facilitator will be copied in on the email from the student to me saying how their day went and letting us know if we need to address anything. On a weekly basis, both the individual students and the professional mentors that they are assigned to at the hospital um, are asked to do written evaluations. And so that's a lot because the students are there every day, Monday through Friday. Uh, some of them are two days a week. Some of them are three 
days a week. So what we do is I have the students required to, and this is a part of the agreement, your students will be required to submit a minimum of two written assessments per internship week. Um, with those assessments from the students, we're able to determine what to focus on for their next week. And just to give you a bullet of what might occur, doing that weekly assessment, there is a question that asks, based on your experience, how do things go for you? Is there anything that needs immediate attention? Is there anything that you would like to see occur differently? So mind you, they've already checked out, but now they have an opportunity because sometimes as they're writing, they may think of something else that needs to be addressed. Um, and then we provide immediate follow-up and include the teacher facilitator in on that as well. So basically, the whole collaborative process is a partnership uh, where we're having open dialogue between the student, um, BJC School Outreach, and the school gets copied in on everything. When we look at the shifts that had to be made, as COVID started emerging, a lot of parents were being concerned about their students being in the hospital just because, I mean, they were just very concerned. And I started getting phone calls from parents or students would actually come. They would come and prior to the check-in process would ask to speak to me and just let me know that their parents were concerned. Uh, with that, I was able to reach out to the school liaison and the parents to say, um, these are the steps that we take to protect your student. However, if you would feel better that they not go out on clinical, we created a classroom space so that the students could sit in a classroom and begin to work on these final projects, which are assigned to the students at the beginning of their internship. Um, typically, the final projects are pretty much the same, but we quickly found with the emergence of COVID and how we were, things were changing so fast that we needed to go back and reassess how we had assigned those um, final projects and begin to rely on the student to tell us what they could do. And in addition to telling us what they could do, telling me, how can you get this information to us? Because we need this final project. How do you see working on it if we can't meet anymore? And so that meant asking students how they could communicate. Uh, the majority said, Ms. Irvin, I don't have access to email. I can text you. Will that be okay? So I'm talking to their teacher facilitator. This student would like to text. Can we do a group text? So the text is where we use group me and the teacher isn't on those texts when they come back and forth. Uh, one of the students didn't have access to email. The student also didn't have access to no in a computer at home, didn't have access to any of that to be able to create a PowerPoint. So this particular student took time and wrote an essay. And so working with the teacher, I wanted to make sure that the student would not be penalized for a final project because there was no access to create this PowerPoint that we would typically do. So for that particular student, credit was issued based off of the essay that was written about the experience during the internship that had been completed already. Um, again, dialogue, so very, very important. Um, even to date, having students log on on a regular basis if they're able to or touch bases because these final presentations are due on April the 25th. That at the beginning of the internship, doing orientations to students are told, you'll get this wonderful experience. What we, BJC, want in return is for you to put together this final presentation where typically we would have a large symposium where the hospital president, the mentors that the students would have been with would have an opportunity to view the PowerPoint presentations, ask questions of the students and make sure that they have provided a meaningful experience. Fast forward to today, what we're doing with the presentations is the students are working on them, but what we're doing with them this today is with regards to HIPAA, what I've asked of the students and their facilitators, when you finish your presentation, you have to finish them before the 25th of April because now I'm getting all presentations sent to me so that I can review them and make sure they are HIPAA compliant, that there is no PHI included in the presentations and that they meet the standards of our organization with regards to patient confidentiality. So I'll be giving the initial grade or okay for the student to in turn take that presentation, turn it into their facilitator, which will share it out to their school district and let them see what the students have worked on. Um, and then we will also archive those presentations so that once we get back to our next state, our next phase, um, the students will be able to share out via a presentation, via a packet with their mentors, what they were able to um, come up with for their final presentation. 
One last point that I'd like to mention in terms of what we were able to help the students with. So they don't have access to us. They can't come in and, and revisit the departments. So I was able to connect a number of the professionals that were working with students were more than willing to do virtual meetings. So connecting them via Zoom so that that student could ask questions. I'm on the Zoom call, the teacher's on the Zoom call, the student's able to do that interview that he or she was not able to finish. Um, taking students on a virtual tour. There are some parts of the hospital that are definitely off limits, but there are other parts, like I had students doing internships within facilities and engineering, there are some parts that they can go back to and take a second look because they want to include some of that information on their internship, so on their final presentation. So basically what we're finding is that we're just having to really, really meet the students where they are, let them know that their final presentation is very, very important to us, and let them feel like they are still, while they are not physically on our campus, that they are still connected to us in whatever way meets their needs in whatever way they're able to connect. Thank you, Jennifer. Exactly. Absolutely. I mean, you've done so many intentional things here to think about all the students, think about creating that quality. I love the virtual tours where I'm like, wait, I wanted to check one more thing on that before I submit my project. Um, it's incredible. So I know there was one question just about how many students um, are accepted each year to participate in this opportunity. So for this particular career and technical education opportunity, this is just at Barnes Jewish Hospital. At Barnes Jewish Hospital, we will typically take a max of 22 students. That's one hospital. Then at one of our other hospitals, uh, Christian Hospital, we run a whole nother set of students through a program called the CAPS program. So we also have, in that CAPS program, we have 14 students that are there. And at our another hospital, we have 15 that are in a pre-professional health science. So we have a, a variety of programs. This one I chose to focus on career and technical education just because I know that that's where the students are required to do those internships. And I just want to throw in one thing that I heard on the last when we were asking questions about plans, um, because I'll share with you one of the things that we've been doing for the last 13 years is called the Best Pharmacy Institute. And if you visit the website, you can see a little bit about it. But that was a challenge for us because the students go through formal interviews. And so just last night, we were able to interview 45 students via Zoom. So there's 15 professionals and 45 students via Zoom for this program scheduled for this summer and we're tweaking as we go. Typically the students will come, they'll get this phenomenal experience, the seniors get to stay in the dorms of St. Louis College of Pharmacy for the uh, three weeks of the summer. We don't know what we'll have but what we do know is that there will be a BEST program in some form this summer. So we've done our interviews. Now we need to really, really plan on how we're going to, if we have to make it virtual, what we're going to do in that space. So we're adapting as we go and just continuing with our programming. The paid internships for our college students, unfortunately, we had to send out letters to say, unfortunately, we will not be able to offer the paid internships this summer for any of our college students. Yeah, there's definitely just choices like that that have to be made now and unfortunate, but what needs to be done. So and again, Jennifer, I just like that open dialogue piece. Like I, I can't commend you enough on that. Like that's the way that you're making all this happen, right? Continuing to talk to each other so that you can adapt, plug into what those like needs and gaps and problem areas might be and figure those out together. So like to that point, there was a question about the types of agreements that you have with schools. Um, you know, HIPAA being used as a barrier a lot of times to allow students to participate um, in hospital, especially um, in clinical type experiences in hospitals. So if you could speak to that and then I think I might move us forward then with Betty just to allow for time. So real quickly in terms of our agreements, so one of the things that we have within our department that covers all of our hospitals is we have a career exploration policy and within that policy we partner with our legal department to say what must occur and we have the schools to sign off on that. So the students have to participate. They all of our students get onboarded as if they were employees. So they go through HIPAA, they go through employee orientation, they go through a background check. So that helps us with that whole piece of our professionals being comfortable with having these students in the clinical space. Um, if you have any particular questions, I believe my email address was on the first slide, but I'd be happy to send a few samples or even a sample agreement that we utilize uh, because it's, we're finding that it's not a one size fit all we take we have our master agreement our policy is our policy however when it comes to agreements with the different school districts sometimes we have to adapt and again 
modify it so it meets the needs of that particular school district. Absolutely. I've heard a lot um, before, like, how do you get through HIPAA? It's like, you don't, you got to do HIPAA. <laughs> you know, they got to be trained. They got to go through the process, like treat them as an employee. So yes, um, your in email information is definitely included. It's even just on the previous slide. The slides will be sent out. So thank you for being willing to share those, Jennifer, and for your time today. Um, and then we're going to move forward here with Betty Hart from the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy, who is doing a lot of efforts around virtual trainings and thinking through what the summer could look like. Um, for students to still have that work-based learning, authentic um, internship experience. So I'll turn it over to you, Betty. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I will um, honor your time. I know this ends soon. I'll just let you know that um, I am presenting this to the student and parent population. It's really open to the public tomorrow night. I believe that um, registration information did go out in a recent newsletter. I put my contact information in the chat box in case you want to attend the open session tomorrow night or if you want the video recording and or slides. So I've been addressing some panic and concerns around what uh, is happening with our students at Illinois Math and Science Academy. Just about me really quickly. I am the innovation program manager with a focus area, a very passionate focus area on STEM pathways and the future of work. And one of my um, hats that I wear is managing our internship program through the year and the summer cohort. And as of late, we've canceled our summer cohorts due to the uh, panic around this epidemic because everything is so uncertain right now. So I've been staying really connected to some of the conversations that are going on with employers and colleges and just trying to inform our student base or, or any student base and parents around what can happen. So here's what I do know for sure. I can confidently say people are still hiring, even though our unemployment rates are very, very high. There are um, companies that are still hiring, so I wanted to kind of begin with that positive piece of information. Um, just a little anecdote about me. I have two teenage daughters. One is a college student, one is a high school student, and my high school student just signed up for Instacart, so she will be gainfully employed very soon here. <laughs> I was like, oh, so people pay you to buy groceries, and okay, that's good. <laughs> All right, so yes, companies are turning over to a virtual remote option, as um, Jennifer just shared. Um, they're looking at ways to do things differently because they're forced to do it differently. And a lot of it will be project-based learning opportunities or micro internship focused. So I've asked the students to just be strategic because the market is going to be very competitive. Be realistic and be patient. Some of my pieces of advice to them is to pivot in this disruption to basically, if you had a plan A, now it's time to enact plan B or C. Oftentimes, our students are full steam ahead and they're not paying attention to the things that are happening around them. They are not watching the news like us adults are. So it's important that we get our arms around them and inform them and, and prepare them for this pivot. You know, depending on our age ranges, we've been disrupted many times in our lifetime. This is a first and this is a scary time for our students right now. So I'm just trying to, again, inform them of what people are saying. Putting things into perspective, again, my daughter was laid off. One is put on hold for her job. And so my oldest was panicking because she has a car note. She has responsibility. And just kind of giving her some perspective about some other things that she can be doing with her time. And I'll share some of those anecdotes as well. And then if you have the ability to reach up and reach out to your community and do other things with your skills and talents, we're asking students to consider that as well. So students are often asking me daily, I'm getting emails, what can I do this summer, Miss Betty? Is there an internship? You know, what can I do? I'm graduating, I'm freaking out. Obviously we want them to stay calm. Um, I have two daughters, but also have nieces and nephews, and I'm very, very close to a lot of the students personally. And so a lot of conversations about um, being grateful, right? Gratitude is a huge must right now and staying happy. I say stay woke, that's just a little jokey joke, but it's really stay informed. You know, TikTok is great, but they have to be informed about what's happening. And then staying busy. Um, I always tell my daughters, don't tell me you're bored because I got a list of things for you to do. <laughs> so if you have children, you can relate. <laughs> so there's always something for them to do. There are some of the things they can do, obviously, are volunteer. Um, if you're watching the news like I am periodically, a lot of information is coming out around the need for food bank resources and volunteers. So a proud mama moment. My daughters went to volunteer locally at a food bank yesterday to package some food. And it was, it was an eye opener for them to see, you know, the greater needs of their community. So volunteering, not sitting on your hands. Volunteering could also look like tutoring. It can look like mentoring. 
And in these two opportunities, this allows students to network and, and meet professionals in different industries that can possibly open them to an opportunity for an internship, job shadowing, apprenticeship, and or even a job. I say upskill and reskill. You should always continue learning no matter what age you are. So upskilling is basically enhancing what you already know, right? So you may be at a basic or an intermediate level. But if you have the time in your hands and you're like, I'm not interning this summer, I'm not working this summer, then you should definitely continue the momentum by upskilling, learning a new, uh, enhancing your skill. And then reskill, learning a new skill. There are lots of in-demand skills right now. Um, technology obviously is the, the number one skill that companies are looking for. So I also say, look at another direction, right? So if you don't know how to cook, learn how to cook. If you uh, wanna learn how to drive, learn how to drive. There's always something to do. Learning never stops at any age. So these are some online learning platforms that are disrupting education as it says there. But again, no excuses. I don't wanna hear anyone say I'm bored. I don't know what to do. It is our responsibility to educate and inform. And so this is where I point students most of the time. Learn a new language. Again, upskill, reskill. Learn a skill that doesn't even relate to, like maybe you wanna do something that is totally unrelatable, like play the guitar. Learn that, but just continue showing growth because what happens is if they can show growth that looks favorably amongst employers right and and college applications so i just continue the momentum is what i keep telling so in my former life i was a career coach and i use this website quite often for um the members that i serve and so i point the students to this website i use it a lot more now that I'm creating this STEM Pathways program under the guidance and direction of the career development um, efforts, it's an eye-opening experience for them because they didn't realize that this existed and then they didn't realize that there are other opportunities, free training, again, certifications, and all kinds of tools and resources. So if you are not familiar with this website, highly encourage you to check it out. Um, we don't have to be officially, and this is just my opinion, we don't have to officially be certified career coaches to have just little nuggets that we can provide to students. And this is simply a nugget. Other things they can do is dress up that resume. So again, many of them are aiming towards going to college. And so they're putting a lot of stuff on their resume that's relevant to college scholarships, opportunities. But what they don't realize is the college scholar, or I'm sorry, the college resume and the professional resume are two different things. I actually had a student, I was reviewing her resume. She is a junior and she sent me a curriculum vitae. And I was like, what in the world? <laughs> very impressive, might I say, she was very impressive. Um, so she was ready, but not quite, right? She wanted to go into, uh, she was looking for an internship in law, but her, her curriculum vitae was a little bit all over the place, it wasn't pointed. So I had to give her some information. Um, I follow this blog on LinkedIn called Get Hired. That's where the most relevant current information about who's hiring comes out of lately for me. And um, some of the professionals on there, some of the HR managers and execs say, put your skills first on your resume. This may some, be something we as adults already know, but students don't realize this. And they also don't realize what skills they have that relate to those things. So again, these are spaces where we can mentor them to pull those things out and showcase them up front. So it just makes it easier in this time where there's, last time I counted, 16.6 .6 million people unemployed, when they're applying to something that those students are seen more favorably if they're following what the guidance of the professionals. And then also branding. I did a, a webinar yesterday on professional branding at the student level, right? So number one, you should have a LinkedIn page. LinkedIn is now um, available and open to students. Now, as a parent, I share the same concerns about privacy and, you know, predators. So I walk my daughters through the process. I explain to them about making quality connections and how they're showcasing themselves on LinkedIn, but also throughout social media. What message are you sharing? So these are like hobby areas that students also can be working on over the summer through the guidance of mentors like us in this network. But if they say, but yeah, that's great, Miss Betty, but I really, really want an internship. Okay, so here are some pieces of information where they can start looking. So there's actually a website that was created around this COVID crisis called Cove Intern. And it's just people sharing information about internships that are still happening. Because as mentioned earlier, a lot of colleges have pulled back um, their internship opportunities. A lot of businesses are taking down their paid internship opportunities, but there are still opportunities out there. I think I just broke one down. No, I'm sorry. I was taking good notes from earlier. So Cove Intern is a website. 
there, if you type in internship.com, that company is called Chegg. That's another um, source. Professional associations have people who know people. So again, pointing students towards like Society of Women Engineers or uh, Women in Tech, um, things like that. And then obviously job board sites to go there and double check. And then fun fact, students may not know this and you may not know this as well, but I come from working with the federal government and there are high school level paid internships within the federal government and sometimes state and local. So helping students kind of point, point them in that direction and let them know like there are paid internships out there if that's something you're seeking. This was a really great report that came out like pretty quickly in the panic around what do we all do collectively? How do we all respond to this COVID crisis since it's literally put a lid on all of our plans, most of our plans for this summer. And so this um, report came out of the Center for Research on College Workforce Transitions from the University of West Madison. It's available online. Um, so yes, definitely something to just read through if you are an organization, you're like, uh, I don't know how to navigate through this if you're a student or college. So I had a great conversation with Parker Dewey. Parker Dewey is a source. So the best way I can describe this, if you're not familiar, is they are a matchmaking service. No, I'm just kidding. But, but basically they are. They um, seek out opportunities for micro internships from companies. And then students, high school graduate and college level students can access this board for these projects and get paid to complete these projects. So while I do primarily work with high school students, what they did tell me was they, the students can access templates of these projects. They can access their blog and resources, but they cannot apply. So this does not apply to high school students. They actually have to have been graduated, going off to college or be college level student. But again, another um, source of information, I get their newsletters in my inbox and it's, it's very informative and very timely. So this is just some information for you. Again, I can email you the Zoom web links um, if you message me. And I do believe, again, this went out in the newsletter. So thank you all for sending that. I'm gonna talk in depth a little bit about STEM pathways from the Illinois Math and Science Academy perspective, but also talk about some future of work, things that are happening out in the economy. A lot of it was inspired by JFF.org at the conference that I attended. So thank you all for that. I am also offering one-on-one -on -one coaching. I don't limit my abilities and skills to just our students. So if anyone would like to talk more about what I've just talked about offline, please let them know. They can reach me through Calendly. Get at me is my professional brand. Now my students came up with that. <laughs> I told them I need something hip and that you guys get. And they're like, get at me. So that's basically the, using the power of the at, the at sign and how that connects us to the messaging that is out there in the social media. And then improv your communication is just my way of saying, let's not take this so seriously. We're all communicating through technology right now, but a lot of students have to interview or they have to do presentations. So let's try to put some fun, some infuse some fun into that. And I'm doing that the last two weeks of this month. And then my little, um, my three little boys here, this is just me infusing again, some pet therapy because people are stressed out right now. So these are my boys saying, don't quit just keep going, just do it. And this is me. This is how to get in contact with me. Um, be hard at imsa.edu. I put that in the chat box. You can find me on LinkedIn. Our organization that I work for at IMSA in two is on Facebook. And then again, you can meet me on Calendly for a one-on-one. -on -one. Awesome. Thank you, Betty. And so we can have some time for questions here too. I know there's definitely um, some folks saying they weren't aware of federal paid internships. So that was a, <laughs> definitely a good good information for that and just lots of sharing about the different ways to engage students. And again, like you said, there are plenty of things that they can be doing, right? It's just helping um, inspire and motivate them to do so and getting them access to it. So I know there was one question just thinking about volunteering, right? Um, and thinking through what it looks like to, you know, it's great, but encouraging it at this time. Um, if you've had any kind of thoughts on that. Well, um, volunteering, again, as I mentioned, can be done online. You can tutor online. Um, you can mentor online. Me personally, how I parent is I, I parent by paying it forward. So my daughters go out to this particular organization. The organization provides them PPE gear or else I would not let them go. <laughs> so it's really, you know, to each his own and how they're encouraging their students. And obviously we are sheltering in place, yes. So we wanna be mindful of that as parents and as educators, but um, 
most of what I'm suggesting to our students is online stuff. Great, thank you. All right, well, again, all of this is gonna be sent out. Um, thank you both again. So Betty and Jennifer, their contact information is included. So please continue to you know, reach out to them. Um, sounds like they're both willing to do that, which is awesome. And I'm gonna turn it over here to Edith to talk through the different resources um, and then the next steps here, but thank you all. Sure, thanks Heather. And thanks to all our wonderful speakers. I think this was really informative. So in terms of the resources that were discussed, we have them arranged for virtual learning and for virtual work-based learning. And we're going to put all these on the 60 by 25 website, as well as send out an email with this information. And so as we said earlier, Earlier. We will share the recording of this conversation with the full network, share the resources, and continue to provide avenues for collaboration and con conversation, and provide direct uh, supports to you. So please let us know how we can be helpful, and we hope that you will stay healthy, continue to share resources with us, and I'll turn it over to my colleague uh, Jessica to talk about the next webinar that we are organizing next week. Thanks, Edith. Um, and thanks, uh, everyone, for sharing such great insight today. Uh, always really grateful for all the talent and amazing work happening uh, within this network. Um, so our next webinar is on uh, Monday the 20th from 11 to 1230. Uh, and our focus for this webinar will be uh, how communities are meeting students' basic needs and advancing equity amidst a pandemic. Uh, and we're still working on, on um, uh, finalizing some of our guests, but uh, one of them is including um, Dave Ardry from the Association of Rural Schools. And he will uh, be getting into some detail about how rural communities are doing um, to advance equity and making sure that our students are getting their most basic needs met. Um, anything from uh, you know, making sure that students are fed during this pandemic and, and, and safe at home. So um, more to come there, but we hope that you can join us. Please uh, save the date and add it to your calendars. We'll send some more details over email after this webinar as well. Right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we hope you have a good rest of your day and that you stay thank safe you. and healthy.